This is the American Greed Podcast presented by CNBC. Who's the man? I'm the man. My name is Dr. Ronald Gilbert, and I'm here to introduce Promescent, a treatment for premature ejaculation. Men are starting to buy Promescent not to treat PE, but just to last longer. Now, who knows where it will all end? 52-year-old Dr. Ronald Gilbert was shot and killed at his medical office just before 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Sex, drugs, money, and murder. A case of greed on an international scale. I'm CNBC special correspondent Jane Wells. And I'm Chuck Schaefer, executive producer of the CNBC original series, American Greed, on this podcast special, The Promescent Affair. The drug promises to be a game changer in the bedroom for millions, but after its discovery comes money and a murder. And a David versus Goliath battle ensues over its billion dollar secret to great sex. This is the American Greed Podcast. Welcome everybody to the latest American Greed Podcast special, The Promescent Affair. Promescent. Uh, yeah, I'm joined by CNBC special correspondent Jane Wells. Hello. And Jane, what's promescent? Okay, it's, uh, if you're in the car, you can't see it. It is this. It's a little bottle that uh, has, I don't know, a couple fluid ounces in it. It's a spray that men spray on their private parts for um, a condition known as premature ejaculation, or PE. So we're talking about putting this tiny bit of spray spray on your on a man's private parts on an erect penis no uh, uh yes exactly it's the opposite of viagra mm. so pe uh is the opposite of ed ed mm. is when you can't get the party started pe is when the party's over before you even get going did we mention this is for adults <laughs> yes um th- we're gonna have a lot of bedroom talk Very good. a lot of um private part talk okay yeah everybody in the car yeah. So now you've been warned. Mm-hmm. Um, so this it's a it's considered a far more widespread problem than people think. It could potentially be a very very large market, and there's also not just men who suffer from PE, but men who might just want to extend their performance time, because historically there is a gap between arousal between a man and a woman and and orgasm, and this is supposed to help close the gap. And uh, I think I read sixty four percent. Yes, uh, Promescent makes the claim that it can extend a man's performance up to 64% longer. So if you're two minutes, you know, now you're like three minutes and 20 seconds, uh, that, that sort of thing. There have been many products on the market for years that uh, sprays. This is a lidocaine-based spray uh, that have been on the market, Stud 100 and a couple other things. What is unique about Promescent and why it's the number one seller on Amazon is it has a patented protected absorption formula where it is absorbed by the man to desensitize him to extend performance without be impacting his partner. So whoever he's having uh, sexual relations with will not be affected by this. Will not feel numbed. Correct. Okay. Correct. Without getting too personal, what got you involved in this story? Well, in uh, 2013, in October 2013, the story came across, I don't even remember how it came across, but this sort of campaign for this new sex drug, it was a big splash, and, um, and I thought it would be a, a, an interesting um, story to do, just because I'm always looking for weird stories. And then I found the backstory about its creator, which was pretty fascinating as well. 2009 is when it went to market. Uh, Dr. Ron Gilbert was the urologist in Orange County, California, who he had seen many patients come in for years saying that they suffered from PE and either current products didn't work. Sometimes people prescribed antidepressants and you didn't want to be on a medication and he thought if he could create an effective over-the-counter inexpensive accessible way Mm -hmm. this could market could be huge I mean ED Viagra was already a billion dollar drug and why why couldn't this be again not just for men suffering from PE but men who wanted to extend performance Mm -hmm. we called it a billion dollar secret to great sex exactly so the market is there Right. Even if you don't have P.E., I bet men and women out there know that there is a gap between when he's happy and when she's happy, Mm -hmm. usually. And this was to sort of close that gap. Okay. So he was, he developed it. How did it 
really come to market? How did it get in a bottle? Well, uh, so Dr. Ron Gilbert worked and worked for years, very popular, successful urologist in Orange County, creating it, spending money. And then in 2009, he launched it with a company called Absorption Pharmaceuticals and tried to, you know, he wasn't a businessman. Mm -hmm. And so he came out actually in 2010 with a YouTube video where he's in it explaining what the drug does. And it's got some kind of sort of cheesy, like, who's the man? I'm the man, mm -hmm. sort of ad campaign. Who's the man? I'm the man. Introducing Permethent, a safe and easy to use topical spray that helps you temporarily slow the onset of ejaculation. Who's the man? I'm the man. My name is Dr. Ronald Gilbert, and I'm here to introduce Promescent. And then around 2011, he brought in his very good friend, um, uh, Jeff Abraham, who was his patient. They had okay. become friends. And Jeff was a retired executive, and he said, you know, will you come on board and help me really scale this company? So Jeff came on as CEO mm -hmm. in 2011 to try and scale the drug. So he was the businessman who would bring this to market. Absolutely. Okay. And how did that work out? The goal was to build it and prove proof of concept and then sell it to a huge conglomerate who could then scale it like Viagra. Okay. And things were working out well. Um, but how? where's Dr. Gilbert today? Dr. Gilbert is dead. He was murdered in cold blood, shot 10 times on January 28, 2013, as he opened the door to an exam room. Dr. Gilbert had been married for 24 years to Elizabeth Gilbert, and they had two sons. And that morning, she was in New York for her, they had a son in New York, and she went to a friend's wedding. And they had spoken on the phone that morning, and they were just, he was driving to work, uh, and they were kind of at a place where life is good. Mm -hmm. That afternoon, she said she did something she always loves to do, and she told us about this. She always liked to walk down Madison Avenue when she was in New York. And it was a cold, windy day. All of a sudden, I felt like my, my soul was leaving my body. It was so, I cannot describe it. It was just so bizarre, so different than anything. I couldn't even walk. It was like, literally, I, I had to make such effort to, 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 to take a step. So I got back to the apartment, I laid in bed, and I just, I don't, something was missing in, in me. You know, like seriously, my soul was not there. And, uh, and I, I was getting all these phone calls, and I couldn't answer. I didn't have the strength to answer the phone. And then the partner called, and then I realized something's happening. So I pick up the phone, I answer him, and um, I, I, he just said, you know, the patient came in, and, Later, she returned the phone calls and found out that at the moment she could no longer walk was the moment her husband was murdered. Wow. What a connection. Yes. Yeah. And she was devastated, then flying back. Mm -hmm. She didn't know who, who would kill. He was the head of the synagogue. Yeah. He was head of his department at the hospital. He didn't seem to have an enemy in the world. Uh, this just, she couldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Why would somebody want to kill him? Was it? over this? Was it over... This, this is the weirdest story, and this is one of the weirdest parts of this whole saga. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gilbert was killed by then a 75-year-old man named Stanwood Elkis, who 21 years earlier had a botched prostate surgery at the VA where Dr. Gilbert worked at the time. Ron Gilbert did not do the surgery, but the surgery did not go well, and Stanwood Elkus for years said he was incontinent, uh, he couldn't have sexual relations with women, uh, and that he discovered later that he actually didn't need the surgery, and he blamed Gilbert for this and held this grudge that grew for why, 21 years, who knows why, mm -hmm. even though Dr. Gilbert was, the man, was not the man who conducted the no. surgery. And so... Leading up to January 28, 2013, he got his will in order. He started to make arrangements. He was telling people, neighbors, they might not see him anymore. And he made an appointment to see Dr. Gilbert at his office that day mm -hmm. uh, under an assumed name. Alan Gold was the name. And he goes up to the receptionist, and she asks for his ID, and he says, oh, I left it in my car. He goes into the exam room. He had purchased a weapon, a Glock, earlier, mm -hmm. the month before. And as soon as Gilbert opens the door, he just shoots him in cold blood. 
He tells, according to police and prosecutors, he tells uh, the office staff who hear these shots, call the police, I'm insane, hands them his weapon. The police arrive, and Gilbert died right there in mm -hmm. the hallway. So he shot this man. He went to trial. What was his defense? That he was insane. Uh, that he had was taking antidepressants, his meds were off, and he was his mental capacity was increasingly diminished, uh, and that he lost his mind. But the fact that he had bought the well, weapon— Well, how did—that's how, what I'm going to ask you. How did the uh, prosecution— knock that theory down. They showed that he had been planning this for months, if not longer, and uh, that he had put his affairs in order, that he had gone and bought this weapon, that he had apparently been researching a driving, you know, he lived not near the doctor's office, how to get to the doctor's office. 50 miles or something like yeah. that away. Yeah. And, yeah. and so they, the jury believed that he, that this was not an, the act of an insane man, but that someone who would, with a sound mind, had planned this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And to make things even a little more poignant about the company, about the friendship, um, Jeff Jeff sent a text to Dr. Gilbert that morning. Yeah, another um, sad twist. That very morning, uh, that very morning, Jeff Abraham texted Ron Gilbert. They'd had an offer come in again. They wanted to sell this company. He had sent me a text message uh, 43 minutes before he was murdered, and said, "Hey." Thank you very much. You know, we got that offer. You know, the things are going well and the future's really bright. And I, I sent, I texted him back and I said, fasten your seatbelt, the ride's just getting started. And to have, to go from that euphoria to him literally being dead 46 minutes later, it's hard to grasp. So, I hate to say after murder, moving on, but it's a company moving on. Well, this was a big deal for Jeff. Uh, what does he do? You know, the, the, the company, the product was Ron's dream. And just, he's devastated as well. Here's sure. his good friend. And he thinks, what do we do with this company? Mm -hmm. So I thought if I stayed and made this successful, it would do two things. It would give him a legacy, which I thought he deserved. And it also would provide for Ellie and the boys. Well, right then, sales were like 1.5 million. Yeah, one and a half million for that yeah. year. So mm -hmm. they were, they, but they were they were scrappy guys who were like making a website and trying to sell and get this thing going yeah. to show that it proof of concept. So he debated whether or not to just throw in the towel and move on. But then Jeff Abraham said that every time he would Google his friend, it would come up, doctor killed by crazy guy. Yeah. And he told me, I don't want that to be his legacy. And he also wanted to provide money for the family. So he decided to pursue this. And we'll get back to that later. Mm -hmm. The wife and two kids. The wife, the widow and two kids right. at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and who were in, you know, they're in their prime. There was no way that they should have yeah. something like this happen to him. So he decided to go ahead and continue with the company, try to scale it and try to sell it so that they could all walk away. There were also a, about a dozen or plus other investors that had put in money so that they could all walk away into the sunset mm -hmm. and have left uh, Dr. Gilbert a legacy, including on their web page was a part dedicated to him and what kind of person he was to try to counter all this Dr. Killed by Crazy Guy headline mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And then this is when I found out about the company. Mm -hmm. So Ron Gilbert is murdered in January. In October of 2013, so, you know, nine months later, mm -hmm. uh, I get wind of this story and I do a story for CNBC where I talk about move over Viagra. There's a new sex drug mm -hmm. in town. At that point, they were doing one and a half million dollars mm -hmm. in sales. And, and you know, there were Jimmy Kimmel was joking about these products and all this kind of momentum was growing for mm -hmm. it. And that's when I first spoke to Jeff Abraham. Jeff is an unusual man. He's now 61. He has the energy of an 18-year-old. He suffers from lupus and diabetes. Mm. He, he's he's a, a, a blue-collar guy from Pittsburgh who's still got that street fighter in him. Mm -hmm who moved to California in the 80s because he wanted to go to California. I'd never been outside this sort of area where he grew up. Mm -hmm. The and, Three Rivers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and started a tech company. Um, and had always been just kind of this striver. He's a fighter, and he's f so full of passion. And this drug is the greatest thing, this product, and we're going to sell it. And we struck up um, a professional friendship over mm -hmm. the years where he would always contact me and... I always said, look, when you sell to a big company, yeah. I want to break the story. And he'd always Fair. call once in a while. We're getting close. We're talking to so-and-so. We've mm -hmm. got so-and-so. Uh, but nothing was ever quite closing. 
So what happens after that? Well, the next year in 2014, they get the dream interest from a company called Reckitt Ben Kieser, uh, which is also called RB. It is a major UK household goods conglomerate. Uh, they did about $16 billion in sales last year. I think their market cap on the FTSE is around $60 billion. They're, they're kind of like, uh, I don't know, what would you call them, like a Procter & Gamble or a Johnson & Johnson type company. They, have, they own Lysol and Mucinex and Airwick, Airwick, and they also own Durex Condoms and KY, which they had acquired. Mm -hmm. So they hired a guy, a consultant in Europe named Stefan de Pretri, who was a famous veteran acquisitions guy, because RB buys companies. Mm -hmm. So they said, look, we've got KY and Durex now. Why don't you go out and find something for us to buy to help boost the brand? Mm -hmm. And he did his research, and he found this product promescent. He saw that it was the number one seller on Amazon. He, he investigated the company. He tested it out. Mm -hmm. He became a huge believer in it. He said, I think I got the perfect thing for you. So he goes to RB and then with all this information. And so that's when RB contacts Jeff Abraham about possibly doing a deal. Okay. So they start, they, they, become, they begin discussions. They begin. And Jeff Abraham at one point flies to New York to meet the head of RB's sexual wellness uh, division, a guy named Volker Seidau, uh, to have their first face-to-face -face meeting. And Abraham told us it was the sort of meeting you dream about. It was one of those meetings that if you have a company for sale, you dream about. The, he was immediately impressed. And uh, at the end of that meeting, the first day, he literally shook my hand and pulled me close to him and said, we're going to get this done in 30 days. We're going to acquire you in the next 30 days. And he actually named the project Project Speedy. So they wanted to test the product. And so Jeff gave them a bunch of promescent for their top executives, allegedly. Mm -hmm. And he ends up getting an email back from this Volker Saito at RB in all caps saying, it works great. This is fantastic. And so he thinks, well, you know, money's coming in pretty soon. We're going to get mm -hmm. this deal done. RB had a couple of concerns. They wanted to know how big the market was. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know if the product worked. Well, he thinks after he got the all caps email saying it really works, they think it's great, it's fantastic. Okay, mm -hmm. we've solved that problem. Then came the issue of how big is the market? Well, to prove to them that it was big, mm -hmm. and they wanted to know profit margins, they wanted to know how, the, how Promescent was formulated, they signed, according to him, non-disclosure agreements and began, opened a kimono we say in business. Jeff Abraham claims he showed them profit margins. He showed them the formulation for Promescent. And most importantly, he showed them market research, who was buying the products, and how often they were rebuying the products. Because if you have customer retention, that shows that the product was working and popular. So he claims he shows all this information for them. Then they keep wanting more. There are more questions. Suddenly they wanted 15 kilos of promescent, according to Jeff Abraham. That's 33 pounds. I, I don't know. It's, I think of it cocaine. It's, it's like a scar one. face. Yeah. It's great. It's a pound of... It's, it's, it's a lot it's of promescent. It's a pile of promescent, that's for sure. Uh, for testing uh, through uh, their consultant, Stefan Depretri. And then RB still came back. I mean, this went on over months. And then RB, according to Jeff, came back and said, um, we're going to do our own survey to see how big this market is. Mm. And he said, fine, you know, can I see the results of the survey? And he says they told him yes. They did a survey, allegedly. They came back to him and they said, you know what, we think, according to him, we think this market's only worth around $20 million. We're going to take a pass. He said, $20 million? You've got to be kidding me. Can I see the results of the survey? Mm. And he said he was told no. And then he said, hey, we had an agreement. And that they said, no, you're not going to see it. And he never saw it. They didn't quite close the door. So now we're into 2015. Things are kind of still dragging into 2016. Originally, mm. according to Abraham, they were first talking about a deal where they would pay him $20 million and a 6% royalty to acquire the company and the product. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they talked about how there was an agreement on the desk of the global CEO in London, Rakesh Kapoor. Not just some CEO of mm -hmm. US sales, but on the top dog for the entire company. 
Uh, this is what he says he was told. They say they have emails that, that can prove this. But Jeff Abraham became so suspicious that he finally asked someone at RB, are you getting ready to knock me off? And he was said he was told, no, 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 no. We don't make products. We buy products. Wait, knock me off? I thought you meant like murder him. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. I know, I realize this is American Greed in the yeah, show you were. Yes, exactly. But you mean knock off his product. Knock off the product. He went to them, he said, are you going to knock off Promescent? Whoa. And they said, no, we don't do that. We we don't make products, we buy products. Trust but verify. Yes. So then came the fall of 2016. Mm-hmm. He had gotten wind here or there that there was something in the works, and it was making him nuts. I would occasionally get a phone call or an Mm -hmm. email, like, you won't believe what's going on. It's sort of a preview of what was to come. One night in the fall of 2016, Jeff Abraham and a date go to see the Pet Shop Boys in concert in Las Vegas, where he was now living at this point. Pet Shop Boys of West End Girls, Opportunities. Absolutely. Absolutely. He was now living in Nevada. He'd relocated the company there, maybe for tax reasons. Also, he said he wanted to get out of Southern California because he, everywhere he went, he was reminded of his murdered friend. Yeah. So they go to the Pet Shop Boys concert in a venue, and they come walking out on the strip afterwards. And across the street is a huge electronic billboard like they have on the strip with mm. you know different ads or things sure. that go by. And the ad on this billboard says, Last Longer Than a Vegas Marriage. <laughs> So it's very catchy. Sure. And his girlfriend looks at it, or his date looks at it, and she sees that it's a spray, and it has something to do with the bedroom and P.E. And she says, hey, I think that's your product. Whoa. And so he looks up, and in his own hometown, it is not promescent. It is a new ad for this product called Duration Mm. by KY, which is made by RB. A lidocaine-based spray to treat premature ejaculation. That sounds familiar. It sounds very familiar. Yeah. He looks up, and he told us he felt sick. He thought he was going to vomit because his worst fears had come true. He felt he was still negotiating in good faith. He felt the door had not been shut completely. He was afraid they were knocking off his product. And he was concerned that the non-disclosure agreements, he says that they both agreed to, were not being honored. And he felt here was proof in the biggest way possible that they had brought a competing product onto the market, into his market, after for years talking to him, and he had told them everything. Trade secrets. That's the key to this case. Mm. When is a secret... A secret. A trade secret, legally speaking, is something that um, you know, your company knows, Mm -hmm. that the public does not know and could not find out. Now, often in these negotiations, you reveal trade secrets because you've signed non-disclosure agreements. Mm -hmm. When a company rips you off, allegedly, and steals your trade secrets, you have to prove that it was actually a secret. In other words, that you didn't have a salesman a salesman blab somewhere yeah. about your secrets. <laughs> you had to prove that you took reasonable measures to protect your trade secrets. Jeff Abraham insists that he did. What's interesting is then when they launched Duration by KY, that fall of 2016, mm-hmm. according to Ad Age, it was the largest uh, ad launch by that RB had ever done since purchasing KY from Johnson & Johnson. It was a massive, they did billboards, Mm -hmm. there were stories, there were ads, which seems an awful lot of money for a market that you only think is worth $20 million. Mm -hmm. So he's now out of luck, uh, uh, you know, out of millions, out of what, I mean, he's, he's hurting. Jeff Abraham is one of the most unusual people I've ever met. He fights, and he decided to sue RB. Suing them for $150 million, which is about 1% of their revenues for 2018. And, Jane, it's important to note that you've tried multiple times to get RB on the record for an interview, uh, but they've declined. And the company also denies Jeff Abraham's claims. Suing for $150 million is one thing, but doing the lawsuit, couldn't, wouldn't a big company just wait him out or 
hit him with well, paperwork or so he he hired a high priced attorney and accused them of fraud, sued them for theft of trade secrets and also for unlawfully using their clout in the marketplace to harm promescent their product. And we can get into that in a minute. I mean there were several things that were going on. But he has also done this before. Mm -hmm. In nineteen ninety nine, Jeff Abraham sued Hyundai in a very unusual case which made the CBS Evening News and Forbes. At that time, he owned one of the top engineering uh, technical headhunting firms uh, in the country. He was Employment. based in Los Angeles. Yeah. Employment. Mm -hmm. He would find engineers. Mm -hmm. Hyundai was building a new uh, factory or plant or something in Oregon, and he got the lucrative exclusive contract to source engineering executives and techs for them. He started doing that. Then he got a call from his liaison who said, uh, I got word from the bosses here, do not send us any more women or minority candidates. We don't want them. Uh -huh. So he is, uh, this is 1996 is when this actually happened. Mm -hmm. So he's a bit taken aback by this. I could have followed their instructions and no one would have known because I'm the only one who had the jobs. So someone's not aware they're being discriminated against if they never know a job exists, because they had me w working on these jobs, but I didn't feel it was right. So he went over this, his liaison's head at Hyundai and talked to the president of the operation and said, you can't do this. This is, you know, this is the United States of America. We don't operate this way. This is wrong. And that he said he was told, you're right, we'll take care of it. Next day, his contract was terminated. He was fired. And then they were not going to pay him. So they did take care of it. <laughs> they did. But they also learned who Jeff Abraham is. He went out and sued them. And it took a while for him to find a lawyer who was willing to take on Hyundai in this case. But he did. I talked to that lawyer, Stephen Hodge. They went to court. And at a certain point, Stephen Hodge told me Hyundai's attorneys, high-powered attorneys, came to him and, for settlement talks because it was actually getting close to trial. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he said, Jeff told him, yeah, I could settle for $100,000. So he says to Hyundai's attorneys, we'll settle for $100,000. Literally, the attorney laughed in his face, and that was the last settlement talks they've ever had. Ooh. So they go to trial. The jury awarded Jeff Abraham $14.7 million. <laughs> Hyundai appealed, and they later reached a confidential settlement. And in one of the greatest ironies in this story, the same defense firm which defended Hyundai, Shepard Mullen, back in the late 90s against Jeff Abraham, is now defending RB right now against Jeff Abraham. And what are they saying about his claims? Well, he claims several things. Again, fraud, that they defrauded him. Uh, trade secrets, which we'll get to in a minute. Mm -hmm. But one of the other fascinating things about this case is he's also accusing them of unfairly using their clout in the marketplace to harm him. Now, competition can be fair or it can be illegally unfair. The day before Duration, owned by R RB, mm -hmm. KY, was launched, the allegedly knockoff product, Right. Uh, Promescent, Jeff Abraham's product, was being profiled on the CBS show The Doctors. Mm. One of the doctors on the show, they had a joke about it, hey, let's, let's talk about this new product for premature ejaculation. This is the day before. Okay. And one of the doctors takes it home, and he and his wife are in bathrobes, and they're joking about it. He, and they filmed it. And they filmed it. Right. Well, they didn't film them using it, but they filmed them, okay. you know, doing their little, you know, sure. we'll give it a test drive, we'll, we'll report back. He comes on the show, and he says, it's amazing. And as he begins to say the name of the product, he gets the P out. It's P, and the audio cuts out. And when they cut to a close-up of the product, his hand is covering up the name. The next day, Ooh. this launches from a company which is a major advertiser in the United States. It's a product called Duration by KY, owned by RB. Coincidence? I reached out to CBS and the producers of the doctors to try and get comment. They, wouldn't, they would not respond. But the, wait, there's more. Mm. As Duration was hitting the market, Promescent, Jeff Abraham's product, Absorption Pharmaceuticals product, was the number one seller, still is on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, as this product, Duration by KY, <laughs> comes on the market, Promescent starts going behind an adult curtain, they call it, on the website when you try to search for it. In other words, you need, it doesn't come up right, right away. You have to go behind some sort of filter. Whereas other PE products, including sure. one called, literally, Do Me Long and Hard, huh. 
was not being put behind the adult curtain and duration wasn't. Promescent was. Now, Amazon was accounting for the bulk of their sales at the time. Right. So this would hurt. And this only started happening when duration came to market, according to Jeff Abraham. Mm -hmm. So they'd have to argue with Amazon to get it back out from behind there. Turns out, coincidentally perhaps, mm -hmm. the head of... Um, Amazon's vendor relations for these sorts of products is a man named Rahul Batula, who just came over to Amazon a few months earlier after working three years at RB. Uh, RB says he never had anything to do with either product. Amazon says he has nothing to do with either product. We tried to reach out to him individually and could not get any comment from him. But wait, there's more. Then there's Target. Target. Heading into 2016, Jeff Abraham said he had a verbal agreement mm. with Target to put Promescent in 1,600 stores and various SKUs, various sizes, wow. that he spent $400,000 to create the appropriate packaging to be on the shelves. Jeff Abraham claims all of a sudden he was hearing from Target, oh, you know what, we're not that interested, we're going to pull back, we're not going to use you, there are too many products in the market. Oh. He says he flew to Minneapolis to Target headquarters at that point and screamed and screamed and said, we had a deal, we've spent all this money. Mm -hmm. Target agreed to put one skew of that in their stores, uh, but there's much more duration in there. Sure. Uh, Target not commenting, saying vendor relations are confidential. So all these companies are saying uh, they really can't comment, mm -hmm. including RB. So all we have is Jeff's word and... Well, we have more? RB's counterclaims, which finally came out in the... Uh, in the lawsuit. I have to say, over the last several months, I've, I've had a few conversations with RB, nothing on the record, um, and I really only can on the record tell you what they put in their countersuit to him. Mm -hmm. They call him a liar. Okay. They said he's lying, among other things, about all the interests all these companies had to buy Promes and to buy absorption pharmaceuticals, that he was hyping it to them uh, and so that they were felt under pressure to spend money and time to investigate the product. Uh, Jeff denies this. His attorneys deny this. Mm -hmm. But they also point out that even if he did lie, that's irrelevant to whether or not they ripped him off and stole his trade secrets. So we get to their key claim, trade secrets, mm -hmm. trade secrets. There's an interesting thing about trade secrets lawsuits. They've taken off in the last couple of years since Congress passed a federal law, the Defense of Trade Secrets Act. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to now file a lawsuit alleging theft of trade secrets than it is to go file a patent, spend all that money to get your product patent protected, and then file a patent infringement suit. So you've seen a lot more, according to Peter Torin, who's an uh, expert lawyer in this, told me, you've seen like this 30% jump in the first year in trade secrets lawsuits. What's interesting about Promescent is it does have patent protection, and that is the one thing they are not accusing RB of stealing. And I'm going to get in the weeds here. Okay. The patent-protected part of this is in the absorption, and there is an ingredient, an, an ingredient in it called thymol, thymol, which is basically thyme oil. Oh, okay. There is debate now. RB is arguing that that ingredient violates the FDA paper from the 70s on what can and cannot be in here. They're saying that that's not an acceptable ingredient. Their so own, that's why they couldn't make a deal with him. That's why they're saying we wouldn't buy this product because we were concerned it would violate the FDA protocol for this thing. And so we walked away and we decided to make our own product oh. that didn't have thymol in it. We'll get back to that in a minute. They hired two consultants, RB did, according mm -hmm. to Jeff Abraham's attorneys. One said, thymol is not a problem. And the other one said, I don't know, it could be a problem. Jeff Abraham's attorneys at Proskauer, Jonathan Weiss, went out and hired a PhD from Caltech in chemistry, an expert witness who says, this is absolutely not a problem. So that is the heart of the issue. One of the hearts of the issue is, look, we walked away because we, we were concerned if we bought the product, we wouldn't be able, we would get in trouble later with the right. FDA. When it came to the theft of trade secrets, the only thing that I could see in the paperwork is that they, RB is claiming that the secrets had been told somewhere else before, including in a podcast, so that they were no longer secrets. Now, they don't specify what kind. Uh, Jeff Abraham is denying that he ever revealed things like 
uh, customer retention, repeat sales, marketing, profit margins, all these sorts of integral secrets mm -hmm. that you wouldn't want to tell anybody except right. in due diligence. So they're, they're saying basically, he's a liar, the product wouldn't pass FDA muster, and his secrets were not secret. That's their defense at this point, and his team denies all of those. Okay. This, look, all corporations get sued but this is an Arby's first uh, lawsuit. Correct. There's also a case where they were sued, and it also involves another American small startup company, and it also involves a bathroom. I'm going to show you a book here. Mm. This is called The Woo of Poo, and it's written by a woman named Susie Batiste, an entrepreneur in Dallas, who started a company, I think in 2007, called Poo Puri. Mm. I actually profiled her. I've done a story on her, too, not even knowing that our paths would cross. Mm -hmm. She Poopery is a spray-on toilet spray. You spray it on the water, and it's oil-based, mm. and it's supposed to not let the smell of number two, the smell of poo, escape into the room. It's something she hated. She worked for years. You spray it on. Your poo goes in. The gases stay trapped. There's no smell. Whoa. Oh, it's, it's amazing, by the way, if you ever use it. That'll save marriages. <laughs> saved hers. Mm -hmm. uh, she did, when I interviewed her the year, she had $30 million in sales. And she had a viral hit on YouTube where a proper young woman with red hair mm. with a British accent is sitting on a toilet uh, saying, I just dropped the mother load. Okay. And so it was sort of, it was a very, very funny, popular ad. Well, um, a couple years later, another product came on the market in Europe called VI Poo by Airwick which is owned by RB. Hmm. And it had an ad campaign about a well-dressed woman who goes and sits on a toilet. Wow. Now, this was for a UK product, but they had filed the paperwork to perhaps market it in the US. Mm -hmm. So she sued. They settled. Terms undisclosed, she can't talk about it. Right. But she wrote this book, The Woo of Poo, the copy I have, mm -hmm. before they settled. Oh. And in it, in it, she talks about once upon a time, there was a big chemical company that fell in love with poopery. Mm. Uh, they were obsessed with us. They took our sales and marketing materials and convinced themselves it was okay to claim those trademark properties as their own. Since they couldn't be us, they decided to rip us off. And she called the company Wicked Air. Wicked Air, Wicked Air, okay. Yeah, mm. yeah. So they settled, but... but Abraham found out about this lawsuit as he was pursuing his own as, mm. as proof that they have a history of ripping people off. And their claim that it's no. coincidence? Well, they're or, not going to comment on yeah. the uh, poopery. By the way, Airwick now sells it. I think it's called a VI, Airwick VIP in the U.S. Okay. So they are marketing after they have settled uh, with Susie Batiste. They won't comment on that. At all. Well, they won't comment to me on this at all. Mm -hmm. But they again deny they deny everything. And it's important to remember, Chuck, that this case has not gone to trial yet. Yeah. And we don't know what a jury will decide. Mm -hmm. Jeff is a marketer. So there is always a bit of showman in that. Are, what can you say about that? I mean, is there anything that just just doesn't ring true to you or doesn't – or is – you know, where, where are we with him as a character or as a witness in this trial? Here are the issues I see – one of them relevant, actually, here are the issues I see, and I'm not sure how relevant either one of them are. Mm -hmm. One is, what kind of offers was he really getting on the table? Um, and again, Auxilium, this, this large company, made an offer allegedly in 2012. They have a term sheet. I asked repeatedly to see the term sheet. I'm told I can't. Is this by both sides, the, the pharmaceutical company and Jeff's? Side of the story? Uh, well, RB isn't telling me anything. I only no, have. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, but, oh, Auxilium. Yes. Auxilium went radio silent. They've been purchased by Endo. Right. I Endo. called, emailed, nada. But Jeff's attorney says I can't see it at the moment because it's been designated highly confidential under the discovery order. I've asked repeatedly to see some sort of proof okay. that there was an offer made. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, he said one of the reasons why he wanted to keep the company is so that he could eventually sell it, or at least the profits of it, could go to uh, help Ron's widow and two sons. Right. They have not received any money from the company yet. How does she feel about that? She trusts, she told me, we have an interview with her, where she says she trusts Jeff implicitly. Jeff is 
I mean, very few people are left in this world that are like him. You know, there's a reason why my husband attached himself to him. I think he keeps his word. And then after Ron's death, he has been by our side from day one. And she supports this lawsuit. Jeff says uh, that there has been no money to go to any of the investors, that he has actually himself loaned the company hundreds of thousands of dollars as they've tried to scale it, and now they've got to pay a very high-priced lawyer, Jonathan Weiss from Proskauer, mm. to prosecute, well, not to prosecute, to bring this claim. Right. Um, and she supports the lawsuit, and we have her saying this as well, saying it's a matter of integrity, that the big guy cannot do this to the little guy. And she supports Jeff 100%. The evidence that I've seen in the court papers includes an email from Arby's head of sexual wellness saying, this is fantastic, the product really works. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing I have seen hard and fast in the evidence. Other things about like him being told they're going to pay him $20 million and a 6% royalty, right. that uh, there's a deal, a contract on the desk of the CEO. Right. Uh, I have not seen that. However, in a very unusual move and a huge win for Jeff's side, the judge in this case ordered that the global CEO of Record Ben Keyser of RB be deposed in this case in London. Okay, not the head of North American sales. No, right. the top guy, Rakesh Kapoor. Mm. Because the judge said in her ruling that his fingerprints are all over this thing, if in fact these charges are true. So Jeff's lawyers went to London and deposed Kapoor. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, the same week, he announced he will be stepping down by the end of the year. Oh. Coincidentally. So the end of 2019, he's out. Correct. Okay. So Jeff Abraham seems much like RB has been in court more than once. He's also gone to court on a few times. What? What is yeah. he litigious? I asked him that. I said, "Gee, you know, you sued Hyundai. You're suing RB. There was also a small company in Florida uh, called Endure, which was another PE product he sued because they were making false claims, and he won that." And he points out to me, and he told us this, he's never lost, and no one's ever sued him. So they're calling Jeff Abraham a liar. In one part of the case they are. They're claiming that he has made false claims of superiority of promescent over other products in the market, including theirs, mm -hmm. and RB actually wants monetary damages for that. Sure. And because it's a big market, will it be a lot of money? <laughs> they are not putting a they're not putting a figure on it. Whereas Jeff has put 150 million dollars. Right. They have not put. They just want damages mm -hmm. for that. To send a message? From their perspective, and they even say this in their court papers, here was this startup which had no track record of ever mm -hmm. selling a, a healthcare product before. Uh, the way they paint the picture, it was kind of a mess. He brought in an outside investment banker to try to clean everything up for them. Um, so why bother with them? Why yeah. bother with them? Why, why buy it? Yeah. You know, why buy it? We'll, you're a mess. We'll go out and make our own product. Where does Jeff fall, Jeff Abraham fall in the idea of, was he just so naive to just give yeah, this when away? Think, wouldn't you think if someone's asking for 15 kilos of your product and you don't have a term sheet yet, that something tells you I shouldn't be doing this? So I asked him, I said, were you, you know, dumb? I've thought about that quite a bit because in hindsight, you always want to kick yourself. But looking back on it, no. Since these are two, what they claim, different products, why is there a case? Trade secret law, uh, I talked to a couple of different experts in this, uh, that doesn't matter. That can still be considered theft of trade secrets. And even if you don't have a non-disclosure agreement, courts can still find that you stole trade secrets. It's an interest. The key to this case, if it ever makes it to trial, mm -hmm. and we don't know yet if it will, will be, did they steal information from him, whether or not they used it, and was it really a secret? So right now we wait for a trial? We, we wait. We wait. Uh, if there is a trial, it probably will not happen until next year. There's always a possibility of a settlement. Jeff Abraham has vowed that he wants to go to court. I want my day in court. I want people to know what happened. I want, I want this to not happen again. I want companies to realize just because you're 20 billion or 40 billion dollars or whatever, and you see an entrepreneur with an idea, you can't go, why buy it if we can just steal it? It's not right.
We'll see. We will see how this all turns out. And we should follow you to find out how and how do we follow you, Jane? At Jane Wells on Twitter, I will continue to follow the case and send updates as they come in. And I'm sure CNBC will be quite interested in the story, too. And we'll, be, we'll have to come back and do a follow-up when this is all finished. I agree. So you can also follow us at, at American Greed TV, and I hope you do. Thank you all, and I want to thank Jane Wells for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, I'm Chuck Schaefer, executive producer of American Greed. And thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. And remember, don't get taken. Thanks for listening to the American Greed Podcast, presented by CNBC. Thank you.